Now we will talk about patients who are four to six weeks old and who are febrile but they are well appearing. First off when we compare with the previous group of uh, birth to four week old infants these children the four to eight weekers are much less susceptible to bacterial infection. In this group of febrile child febrile children, temperature of more than 100.4 will have between 1 to 5 percent chance of a serious bacterial infection. As you remember, in the less than four week old, the uh, percentage was 15 percent, so 1 to 5 versus 15. It is also important to appreciate this is the time that you're starting to get some of the milestones that will help you clinically. This is more true if let's say a seven-weeker is your patient versus a five-weeker, uh, by seven weeks there will be more to go on. By this time you will get a little bit of eye contact and especially towards the latter part of this group you may even get a social smile. So the first challenge is to decide if there is enough for you to go on clinically. Not every child is going to meet exactly the same milestones at the same time. Clinical judgment is definitely at play here. That is why this subset of patients are definitely more challenging than the straightforward decision making in zero to four week olds. There certainly has been an evolution in the approach to fever in this age group. The driving force behind this evolution um, are two well-researched studies which looked at the practice of complete septic workup in patients under three months and questioned if that was the best approach. This had been the general approach well into late 90s where everyone under three months with a temperature of 100.4 got a complete workup including a spinal tap, got admitted and treated until the culture results were negative, the CSF culture results were negative. These guidelines were developed because experience had shown that there are subsets of patients who required a different approach. So the key to our evaluation in this particular age group is dividing these patients into high risk and low risk for serious bacterial infection. We admit and treat high risk patients and discharge with close follow-up and the option of treatment with antibiotics the low-risk neonates. So these studies were really a way of determining risk in otherwise healthy patients between four to eight weeks. Let's begin with the Rochester criteria. This is uh, the older of the two criteria we're talking about today. The Rochester criteria looked at well-appearing term infants with normal exam term infant here is really important because this is what they looked at when they came up with this criteria. They did not include a 32-weeker who stayed in the hospital an additional three to four weeks. So in order for the criteria to be valid, you have to apply it strictly. This is when perinatal history becomes important. So these guidelines will only be valid for term infants with a fever who appear well. Second element of the criteria is that the infant has no past medical history and no maternal history. If the infant was admitted to NICU after birth or if the infant has already been into your emergency department once with fever, then they have past medical history and this criteria will not be valid for them third element is that they have uh, the infants have no focus for an infection on your exam. There is no clinical pneumonia, no cellulitis. Clinically they appear well. They have a white count that ranges between 5,000 to 15,000. Their urine is negative and if they do have diarrhea their stool screen for WBCs is also, is also negative so f they have an overall negative workup. An LP was not part of the workup in the Rochester criteria. In this particular subset of febrile neonates, 
the negative predictive value for serious bacterial infection is 98.9%. Now, Philadelphia criteria was actually more stringent than the Rochester criteria. This study came out in the early 90s as well. This protocol was based on a study of 747 infants who ranged in age from 29 to 60 days with a rectal temperature of equal to or greater than 38.2 degrees Celsius. The aim of this protocol was to evaluate the appropriateness of outpatient management in low-risk patients. They were fairly conservative in their screening and the inclusion of what they considered to be neonates who were at lower risk for bacterial infection. When based on this protocol, the patient was categorized as low risk, they chose not to treat them with antibiotics and discharge them home with a close follow-up. So this is a protocol in which they did the workup and they didn't treat the patients with antibiotic. Philadelphia criteria was stricter than the Rochester criteria and um, they used uh, number one, they used bands to neutrophil count, and they asked that that be less than 0.2 for you to consider including uh, a, a patient in this protocol. On top of the WBC count, urine, stool, screen, um, they added a two-view chest x-ray, and they tapped all the kids who were in the study. So CSF was also included. And uh, CSF was considered negative when the WBCs were less than 8, and a negative grand stain for bacteria uh, was reported by the lab. So in this study, the incidence of uh, serious bacterial infection was about 1%. So if they met low-risk criteria, you didn't treat them, maybe just 1% subsequently had a serious bacterial infection. And if you... Um, include negative LPs in that, then the incidence of serious bacterial infection drops to less than 0.5%. The key thing to appreciate here is that almost everybody in this workup got an LP. Um, and then based on that LP, they were categorized as low risk and they were not treated and they were sent home. And in fact, they did a follow-up study which duplicated these results. So these two studies were instrumental in changing our approach to a febrile neonate showed that a select set of febrile infants who were older than 28 days can be managed as outpatients without antibiotics after full septic workup given that there was um, a close follow-up. So always in this particular age group um, the ongoing controversy really is okay so we define the subset of uh, uh, low-risk patients. Now in those patients can we get away without doing an LP? Or you can ask the same question uh, by saying, can you clinic clinically rule out meningitis? There's really not going to be, uh, the ability to rule out, uh, clinically rule out meningitis is really not going to be until at least eight, uh, the uh, neonate is eight weeks old. Because that's when you're starting to get some of the milestones, as I just mentioned before and some of the interactions that you need to be really sure that the child is okay. Because it is at that particular age group that the child may start to give you a social smile, make eye contact, things that would reassure you um, that the child is okay. And since they're just developing this, these milestones, it's very difficult to know where the, uh, the patient is in this very narrow four to eight weeks. So I think it's kind of tricky to say that you don't need to do a spinal tap based on your clinical evaluation because I think a four-week-old or five-week-old does look very different than an eight-week-old. Um, so I think the consensus right now is that an LP is still part of the workup for this age group between four to eight weeks. And experts will tell you that if, they're, um, the, if they are febrile in this age group, uh, that they will do an LP. So what is now established practice is that in this four to eight week old baby who is febrile uh, but appears well, we're going to do an entire workup including CBC, blood cultures, chest x-ray, UA, urine culture, pos uh, possible stool screen, and a lumbar puncture. Now after you've done a complete workup, uh, we have to ans uh, answer two questions. Number one, do I admit this patient? Number two, 
do I treat this patient with antibiotics? Now, of course, if the child, you know, falls into a high-risk um, category, for, uh, for example, the child uh, looks ill to you, uh, obviously you're going to do everything and admit that child. Um, if the child that you're seeing uh, has an infection that you pick up on an examination, like a cellulitis, etc., obviously you're going to admit that child. Uh, if their workup is uh, positive, you know, we, we included this, uh, the child in this protocol and they turned out they have a UTI or they have a really high white count, of course you're going to admit those patients and treat them with antibiotics. And um, if you have any clinical suspicion of something being wrong, um, uh, either clinically or in terms of a social situation, um, you're going to admit the child. Uh, for example, if, if it's a very young mother, has an unstable social situation, um, et cetera, then you know, follow-up is a question, et cetera. All those things uh, come into play, and you will be more conservative, and you'll admit those children. Now, after you've done this protocol on a particular patient, and they end up being a low-risk patient for a serious bacterial infection, um, what is your next step? Now, it, this implies that clinically you feel comfortable and the child looks well, your workup is completely negative, then the obvious next step is to have a conversation with the child's pediatrician and talk about the appropriate disposition for the patient. Um, do you arrange for a very close follow-up or do you admit them for observation? Does the child get a shot of Recephin and go home? Um, so, so these are important clinical issues and there should definitely be a discussion with you and the primary care physician uh, and uh, come up with a disposition and a treatment plan with which everyone is comfortable. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's the uh, appropriate way to approach this. At this point, I think the general practice is to send these patients home on antibiotics after a complete negative workup um, and uh, to arrange for a good follow-up. Uh, which includes verifying patients' phone numbers, uh, making sure they have transportation uh, to go for the follow-up. So that's generally, in a nutshell, the approach to a febrile infant uh, between the ages of four to eight weeks. One last word about viral infection. Uh, children who have proven um, uh, viral infection, such as RSV, they're generally at a low risk for uh, serious bacterial infection. Uh, the one study looked at about 1,200 infants who were younger than 60 days, and 22% of these infants tested positive for RSV, and their overall rate for a serious bacterial infection was lower, about 7%, when compared with a control group of 12.5%. Um, they had less UTIs, 5.4 versus 10.4%. They were less bacteremia, less, less positive blood cultures. 1.1% versus 2.3%, and less incidence of meningitis, 0% versus 0.9% in the control group. Um, next, we will pick up uh, children older than eight weeks and discuss approach to uh, fever among them.